Okay, everybody. Uh, welcome. Make sure I haven't checked off any names, so make sure as you leave that I get your name before you leave. Um, as I was saying beforehand, that if you have lab tomorrow, some of you have lab at 10.30, I think, or is it 8, 8, 10.30? Anyway, you have lab in the morning, and it bumps up against our 3M exam, so just check your email. I email you this afternoon to make arrangements for that. Um, and then also, some of you asked about equation sheets, and just to sort of go over the units, so I just want to spend a few minutes going over that. First of all, this is the equation sheet that you'll get. I do want to remind you that in the other chapters that there are really a few equations that you also need to know, and that is the uh, kinematics equations, V equals V naught plus AT, uh, and then also X equals V naught T plus one half AT squared. You also need to know the, the variations of those that we use for projectile motions, and that's like VY equals V naught Y plus AYT, and then Y equals V naught Y, where you're just putting the, the Y or X subscripts. And then, of course, Newton's second law, F equals MA, and then the frictional force, which in, in general is mu times the normal force. So those are the additional equations that you'll need. Um, of course, I don't really think of these as equations, but I guess they are, that you also need to know the formulae to find the, cos the uh, x and y components of vectors. Of course, as you might expect, you're going to have to do vector addition on the exam because that's that's really important, either in chapter four or in chapter what was that chapter two or three where we did vectors just sort of as a separate topic. So of course you'll have to do vector math on the exam. That, that's not a small part of the exam. Um, and somebody asked me about units on these. Um, in short, you never go wrong with SI units. So if you ever have a, any question at all. You just use your SI units. That's, you know, for mass, it's going to be kilograms. For uh, length, it's going to be meters. And for time, it's going to be seconds. That is the MKS system. Uh, in some cases, you don't need to use SI units. And that those cases happen when your units cancel out. So for example, with these, with these equations, our, uh, our kinematics equations, it's okay to use rev uh, revolutions or revolutions per second for those because the units will cancel out in the end or they'll provide you an answer that's also in revolutions per second. Uh, sometimes, let's see, where else was it? Like right here, where I'm comparing two uh, moments, of, or excuse me, angular momenta, it's okay to use non-SI units, that is revolutions per second here and revolutions per second here. By the way, I didn't say this because it's not really a unit, but in our MKS system, we're also using, for theta, we're always using radians. So you'll, you'll need to, if you ever have any question, just always convert to SI units. Um, we didn't do 10 or 11, so you won't see that. And then you won't need this as well, but it'll be on your equation sheet. But don't forget these tables, which will be important for your tests, that, that you're just aware that those things are there. You'll get a printed copy of the equation sheet, so no need to print it out on your own. In fact, I'd rather use mine. You can tear it off in the beginning, and then you'll have it there for you. Um, it'll probably be on the back of your bubble form. So you'll have a bubble form, and it'll probably be on the back of that, so you can sort of flip them back and forth. Students do different things with the bubble form. Second, please. Uh, students will go through and work all the questions, about 40 to 45 questions, and then they go back and bubble them in. I don't care. Uh, whatever you want to do is fine. I, I think that's fine. Luis? No, it's going to be in class. Okay. All right. Uh, 3M is going to be in Pelta Auditorium. You'll have a sign seating. So when you come into that auditorium in the lobby, you'll see a, a sign on the door or on the post out there in the lobby that'll have your name and your seat number. It's like a theater in there. So every seat has a number on it, a row and a number. And then in here, I'll have a map. Uh, it looks like Dr. Olivio had a map on his. So I have a map like that with each seat number, and you have to come in and find your seat. I get here a few minutes early, that way you, uh, you, know, you can find your seat more readily. We will start promptly at 1 o'clock, and then we will also end promptly at 1 o'clock. Alrighty? Okay. Um, it's every chapter, and I, I try to pull equally from those four exams. As I've told you all before, I, I pull questions from those four exams, about 10 to 12 from each exam. And then I, uh, I will change up those questions. 
Of course, I'm looking at exams 4A and B as one exam as well. But I'll change up those questions. Sometimes I change them substantially. They're still covering the same topic and in much the same way. And in some cases, I'm just changing the numbers. But every question gets changed. Every question gets altered. Sometimes it will be a different figure, different wording, different variable that I'm looking for. We'll look at that as we go through some of the tests. Please? Does the test focus on studying level one and conditions? Every test is similar, right? Because it's covering the same material. But this particular final, I pull from your four or four, yeah, your four exams. Um, but at, you know, those are only four exams, or you know, five exams, I guess. If you want to go back and practice other old exams, that's not unuseful. That that can be very useful. Yeah. How should we go about studying those structural questions? Um, you can go back and study the the powerpoints that are online if you like. I think that might be useful if you just have lots of time and you want to spend more time studying stuff. Because usually those questions are in a string of questions. Like if you have a question about the buoyancy of a wooden block or whatever, that there are several questions on that same topic. And so you could see a question that's similar to one of those, that string of questions. You understand what I'm saying? Like, for example, I'm, I'm not saying this is what you're going to have, but uh, that question we had last test where you had the, the beakers with the block in it, and it asked which one read heavier weight. I forget if it was floating or it sunk. I think that one was sunken down on the bottom. Like, you can see that question again, but floating. Right? That, that could be a way to change that. I'm not saying that's what I did, but for example, that, that is something that you could see. All right? I try to make every test novel, because otherwise it's not interesting, right? But I really want to see that you understand the topics and the material. So that's really what you want to focus on, not just focus on memorizing the, the questions or even memorizing how to work the question, how to work that particular question, but that you understand the topic. That, that's really what I'm looking for. Um, I wouldn't say that it's easier than the four exams. Usually the average is a little bit higher than the four exams, but definitely it's not a lot higher, the average. You did great on that last exam, by the way. I knocked it out of the park. But as I said, that was the easiest exam. So um, don't be lulled into a sense of security. Okay. What can we look at first? We'll just sort of go through each of the four exams, but since there's so much, I'm, I'm not really going to do an overall review, but I want to know what your questions are for exam number one, for example. Are you have particular questions about exam number one? This was on dimensional analysis. Um, estimations, you're going to see all that, significant figures, trigonometry. Uh, your standards, by the way, so while this asks about a kilogram, I could ask the same question about the second or the, uh, what's the other one, the meter. So what are the standards? So you need to know all your standards. Um, unit conversions, free fall, graphs, um, understanding free fall here. You won't see number 17. Remember that question was wrong. So you won't see that question or anything like it. Uh, graphing, of course, you're going to see that. You're going to see qualitative and quantitative graphs. And vector addition. You will absolutely see vector addition. It's very important. All right, so which of those, any particular questions or particular topics on exam one? All right, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, number 27? Yeah, so that was the first time I'd ever asked a question like that. So you probably hadn't seen it. Well, you hadn't seen it before, actually. Um, so here, I draw my coordinate system, and vector A is 110 degrees. So I know this is 90 degrees, so that means vector A is right here. I don't know the magnitude of vector A, but I know it's in that direction. And then vector B is down here at 260 degrees, right, from this axis. So that's 260, and this is 110. And it's asking which is the possible solution. What I know is, is that the, the sum of A plus B has to lie somewhere in between those two vectors. If those two vectors are identical, it's going to be right there. 
If vector A is bigger, it's going to be right here. If vector B is bigger, it'll be somewhere in that section of the, of the uh, coordinate system. And so I want to pick out vectors over here that are within this range of angles. And of course, that's vector A, and it's also vector E. But vectors B, C, and D, B is right here, C is right here, and D is right here. None of those lie within that range of space in that coordinate system. So it has to be A and E. So of course, a good way to, just like, a good way to change up this would just be to give you different angles, right? So that, that's if you had this question, that's probably how it would change it. Brooks? So why don't you do tip to tail? Oh, why don't you do tip to tail? Uh, I mean, yeah, you could do tip to tail, where. Yeah. Yeah, let me show you. So if, if vector A is right here, and then vector B is right here, then the sum of those vectors is going to be right there. It still falls within that range of angles. So yeah, you could do tip to tail, but as a general rule, if I ever have two vectors that are like this, then my sum of those two vectors is going to lie somewhere in between them. It's not going to be over in this space, definitely. Yeah? Okay, uh, and let's see, I think, like this one right here. Yeah, so when you have a subtraction problem where you're subtracting two vectors, all you do is you, uh, you flip the direction. So here I draw A, and then I draw B. And notice that I flip the direction of B. And then the sum of those two vectors, I start at the um, tail to tip, I guess. Tail to tip. I start at the tail here, and I go here. Uh, so that's going to be B. That's true too, by the way, like you had, like if you had something like this, if, if I asked for, instead of A plus B, I asked for A minus B. I'm not saying that I will. I haven't even finished the exam, so I don't really know what it's going to look like. But if I asked for A minus B, then uh, negative B would be along the negative Y axis. You can be pretty certain you'll see one like 26 where it'll just have different numbers on it, make sure that you can add vectors. That's really, really important. Plus, it'll help you in chapters three and four. OK? Are we good on your graphs? Good on your vectors? Qualitative and quantitative, how to read these graphs. I can spend time on those, but only if y'all want me to. Otherwise, we'll move on to exam two. Huh? Okay. You ready? All right, we can come back if you want. So uh, let's look at exam two. It looks like exam two. This is one of the harder exams because it had projectile motion on it. And so we have several projectile motion problems, four projectile motion problems, five projectile motion problems. You're going to see one or two at least on the exam. Um, and we had six of projectile motion problems. Then you still had graphing stuff here, some conceptual things about projectile motion. Um, and then the second half of the exam was all about Newton's law. So you're going to see friction. You're going to see an inclined plane. Uh, you'll see. 2D forces, like, like we saw in this inclined plane here, friction like here. Uh, you can see 1D problems, like where we have the block suspended in an elevator that's descending or ascending. And then what is the tension in the rope or something similar to that. You're probably going to see one of these where you have to figure out the equations. OK. You want to look at here. Inclined planes, projectile motion, those are the two big categories. Yeah, Cameron? 22. 22, okay. I didn't leave it up there for I was just, just waiting. So 22, uh, I pushed down on a mass um, with a force of 80 newtons, and I wanted to know what tension is required to accelerate the block. Um, What's important here is to recognize that my normal force is not equal to the weight. So if I have this object, I have a normal force 
So it's pushing up on here. And then I also have a weight, Fw. And then I'm going to take this vector and put it down here. I have this F equal 80 newtons. And so what's important here is that my normal force is equal to the weight plus the 80 newtons. So my normal force is equal to 20 newtons plus the, weight, the 80 newtons, which is the additional force I'm pushing down. That's 100 newtons. That means that my frictional force, which is mu times the normal force, uh, there's my mu, is 0.1 times 100, or 10 newtons. So my frictional force is 10 newtons. So now it becomes, once I've addressed that, I now know what are my forces in the x direction. I have a tension force in this direction, and then I have a frictional force of 10 newtons in this direction. I can say the sum of the forces in the x are Ft minus 10, is equal to MAX. Uh, and so I just solved this for FT. 10 plus the mass, which is 2, times the acceleration, which I want to be 5. And so that's 20 newtons. I have to have a 20 newton force acting on this in order to have uh, an acceleration of 5 meters per second squared. Again, the important thing here is this normal force. I mean, it's all important, but that's sort of the part that students often mess up because you're so inclined to say, oh, the normal force is equal to the weight. The normal force is equal to the weight. But that's not always the case. In fact, you can have uh, a situation where you have a block that's on a, on a vertical surface, right? This is a very similar problem where if I'm pushing on here, let's say with a force also of 80 newtons, then my normal force is equal to 80 newtons. The weight there doesn't affect the normal force at all, that uh, the normal force is just equal to that contact force. So that would be like if I have some object, and if whatever force I push on here will be the normal force that the board is pushing back on the object. I've done problems like that in the past. I'm sure you've seen them in some of the old exams. Okay. It's a good problem. Uh, it helps to think about friction and how these forces, it's really a nice, even though it's just one dimensional, it still is a little deeper than some of the other problems like the elevator problem. Uh, with the elevator problem, you know, a good way to just look at this is if it's descending, then you know that the tension is less than the weight. So since this has 800 newtons of weight, I know that, well, that can't be the answer and that can't be the answer. So just doing that initial assessment helps you to think about the problem and know that your um, the tension is going to equal to the weight minus mass times acceleration. Always, in all of our chapters, your vector diagrams are going to be important. Even up into the fluids chapter, I think with buoyant force, is that uh, if you have some object, being able to draw the vectors that are acting on it. I have my weight, I have my tension, this is like the block suspended in the elevator. And then my acceleration is negative four. And then applying Newton's second law, the sum of the forces equals MA. That's always going to be helpful for you. Brooks? What do you have before? Oh, yeah. So this, this minus right here is the same as this minus. OK? Yeah, but you're right. That really, to be correct, I should have written this as a positive and then brought in a negative number. Yeah, but you're you're right about that. Okay, just being sloppy. Okay, um, make sure you know your inclined planes. Okay, uh, make sure you review those because there are at least two or three questions on the exam of what I've written so far, which is pretty close to the end. Um, I'll definitely have it by one o'clock tomorrow. All right? I promise. <laughs> okay, so for inclined plane, just knowing how to draw your your free body diagrams will really get you a long way in those problems. Um, remember, I have my weight, Fw, my normal force, and then I have whatever forces are added on. Like in this case, I have a tension, and then I think I had a frictional force. No, nope, no frictional force. That's all I have. And so when I'm drawing my free body diagram, 
I'll do it like that. Remember, this angle is 60 degrees. So when I redraw that, it's going to be my normal force here, my tension here, and then Fw cosine of 60 and Fw sine of 60. Okay, and then you can go through the process of uh, figuring out what my tension is. In this case, you don't even need the y, the y forces because I just say Fw cosine 60 minus Ft equals mass times acceleration. You do have to be careful with your signs uh, because I'm looking for an acceleration of one meter per second squared, but it's going up the inclined plane, so that acceleration will be negative one because it's in the negative x direction. So be careful with those. On those inclined planes, it, it matters how the inclined plane is flipped because sometimes up the inclined plane becomes negative and sometimes down is negative. So, Brooks? Okay, so I'm not sure if it was going to be somewhat later down or in the next step. It was like a concept question that said, um, what if a teller you just made? Is it on the next test? It might be. Okay, we can look at that. Probably have to do with work, but you will see inclined planes for work problems too. All right. Um, what else here, y'all? Projectile motion. Remember, you have three or two different classes of projectile motion problems. Really, three. You have this one, where I'm starting at the same level and ending at that same level. I have this one, like number three, where I'm starting at some horizontal level, and then I'm going outward like that. And then I have this one, where I'm starting at some ground level. Or I don't have to start at ground level, but the point is that I finish at some point that is not where I started. In these, usually, almost always, you have to have the time. Otherwise, you have to use the quadratic to find the time. But these first two, you should be able to work both of these. Um, and so remember... How to do that, your first step is to find the time. And each of these have a different method for finding the time. For this one, you say that Vy at the top is equal to zero. And then you have zero equals V naught Y plus AYT. And then you can solve for the time at the top. Over here, you say, well, this distance is 80 meters. So I can find the time that it takes an object to drop 80 meters. And to do that, I say y equals v naught yt plus one half ayt squared. But v naught y is zero, so that goes away, and I have negative 80 because it's going down 80 meters is negative 5t squared. And you solve that for t. And then once you find t in both of these issue problems, it becomes easier. Like that's sort of the first big hurdle is to find t. If y'all want, I can finish working through these, but. Um, you'll, you'll definitely see projectile motion. Uh, I think y'all know that. You know, I've already been prepared for it. Yay, nay. Keep going. Exam three. Okay, we'll look at exam three then. Um, again, we can come back to these. Or if you want to hang out afterwards, we can spend some more time looking at these. So exam three was all about work, energy, and momentum. I think that's right. Work, energy, yeah, work, energy, and momentum. Um, so conservation of energy, that's like these where you have the object that moves up and down within a, a system. Definitely going to see one of those. That's sort of a basic idea I want you to have. So you'll definitely see something like number one, number two, or number three, where you uh, you have to figure out what type of energy does it have at particular points and then find the speed or position at different points. Uh, also, number four is like a work energy theorem. If you remember, uh, this had to do with that any work that is done changes the energy of that object. And so a frictional force does work on an object. The work is the frictional force times the distance over which it acts. And then that's going to change the, uh, the kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. And that's what you were doing there in number four, is that you had this object that had a speed. Uh, it had a certain amount of kinetic energy here, the two meters per second, one-half mv squared. 
And then the frictional force acts on it. You have to figure out what is the frictional force. That's your mu mv, or excuse me, your mu normal force. And then uh, you solve for d to find that distance. We had a couple instances of this. I think we had one on an incline plane too. So I would expect to see something like that. You know, honestly, if you're looking at 10 questions or so from each of the exams, 12 questions from each of the exams, 10, 10 to 12, then you're going to see one from every topic because they have multiple questions in each topic. Uh, probably going to see a spring-loaded object too where you, you're doing conservation of energy, but now you're doing like potential, gravitational potential to elastic potential or elastic potential to kinetic energy. Uh, this was looking at the elastic potential is equal to the kinetic energy. Um, one half kx squared is equal to one half mv squared, and setting those equal to one another and solving for x. Right, number 10 is similar. Uh, you can see units like in number eight, those sorts of things. I like to ask those questions. Uh, this might be the one you're talking about. Is this the one, number 13? Um, Oh, a conceptual question. Uh, on this number 15, remember that work is equal to force times displacement. So if I'm giving a, a, uh, a graphical representation of that, force times displacement, that's always going to be the area under the graph, right? That, that's what that is, right? If I multiply this axis times this axis, that is the area. Is it this one or this one? Okay, a box moves up an incline plane with a tension force and a frictional force. Um, is F bigger than F? Okay, so the frictional force is definitely not bigger than this force. In general, that can't be true. Uh, there are some special cases where it can be, but we never, we never see those. Because uh, if this was bigger, it would be down the incline plane, or be static. Um, the frictional force increases as the block accelerates. F is not dependent upon v so um now that might not be entirely true but we're assuming that's the case as v increases your temperature increases and that might change your frictional force but we're assuming that it's not uh the force f does positive work okay so that that looks like it's the answer the reason is because work is force times displacement and if they're in the same direction it's positive work if they're in opposite directions it's in it's negative work so since the displacement is in this direction and the force is also in this direction, um, then the force does positive work. And D, this is probably what you were asking about, the frictional force is not in the negative x direction, it's actually in the positive x. And that's what I said when we use a typically chosen coordinate system. And that is our typical coordinate system. That's the one we'll always use. It just makes the math a lot easier for these inclined plane problems. Is that what you were thinking about? I was thinking of why the positive work but now I realize it's just the answer. Okay, yeah. Because because it's in the negative x direction, right? And so but because they're in the same direction, that's what's important here. All right. Uh, so that's work and energy. And then we also had uh, momentum. So here's a collision like this. You might see something like this. A lot of these were just like this. Number 21 was really similar to number 20. You're just setting the initial momentum equal to the final momentum. Um, make sure you know these definitions. Impulse, make sure you understand what a force is. That in the concept of momentum, um, a force is the time rate of change. That's on your equation sheet, F equals delta P over delta T. That is our change of momentum, our rate of change of momentum. Uh, that comes into play here for number 24 as well. That's sort of your other type of momentum problem. We have the conservation momentum, and then we have the impulse problem where I'm applying Newton's second law, that F equals delta P over delta T. Same for 23. All right. Good on that. More. All right. Let's look at 4A. For your exam 4, I think there were slightly more questions from, from exam 4A than 4B, just because, you know, 4A was 
It had more content than 4B did. We have that chapter 8. How do I zoom in? Okay. Um, sort of basic kinematics, basic angles, knowing what radians are, knowing how to find an angular velocity of a rotating object, knowing how to relate your linear and angular velocities, like number six. Um, this has to do with centripetal acceleration. AC is V squared over R. R, that's omega squared R. Um, likewise, number three had to do with centripetal forces. Uh, these are all about kinematics. I, yeah, these are all sort of about kinematics. Um, and then we get into moments of inertia, energy. Remember this problem, number 11, where you had to find the total energy, and that total energy included the uh, Kinetic energy, translational, and the kinetic energy, rotational. So make sure you're aware that I, if I have a spinning object that's moving, or a spinning object that's you know at some position, so it has gravitational potential energy, it's going to have both uh, that energy and the rotational. And that rotational is one half i omega squared. Make sure you're careful about the type of object that you have. That's on that equation sheet. So you can find the moment of inertia, the equation for that moment of inertia. Uh, you're probably going to have a one like this where I give you some figure and you have to rank the moments of inertia. Uh, remember on these, what you're doing is you're trying to find the one with the biggest moment of inertia is the one with the most mass at the biggest distance from that point. And so for these, that's C because I got all this mass out here at a really far distance away. So C is the biggest, gets rid of those. And then you have to go through, well, in this case, is A and B bigger than or less than the moment of inertia at B? And because A and B are out here on the edges, they have a bigger moment of inertia than B, which is in the middle. You see, all these distances for D are relatively small compared to those other points. Yeah? Uh, B is less than C. Let me delete all this. Now, it must be a typo. It should be uh, C is bigger than, it should be D. That's number 13. Yeah, that must be a typo in the test. All right. Double check that. So, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. No, that is right. The, the test is correct. So, um, it is B. Uh, the reason is that I'm looking, this is definitely the smallest moment of inertia because it has such a small distance. But A and B, they have masses that are far away, right, out to these distances here. But C, where it would have mass that's the furthest away, there's nothing there. Okay, so C has a smaller moment of inertia than A or B. All right, sorry if I confused you, I'm sorry. What if that wedge was filled? If that wedge was filled? Yeah, A, B, and C would all be the same. And they would all be bigger than B. Okay, um, well, let's... You've seen other questions like this, like what if it was a square and I had points here, here, and here, A, B, and C. Which of those would have the biggest moment of inertia? C does, right, because I have this big distance right here out to that furthest point. And then A, I have a, a less big distance, a smaller distance, and then B is the smallest of all the distances out to those different masses. That's really what you're looking at. I want to find which point has the most mass at the biggest distance. 13 was a tough question. I think I'll miss that one. Um, okay, 
Number 14, the moment of inertia of a combined system has a disc and this particle, which is a kid that jumps onto it. Um, make sure you understand the relationship between momentum, moment of inertia, energy, like number 15. Like that problem is a good example of where it might be useful to go back and look at the concept test because there was a whole string of questions. But that's often the case. So if you just have extra time and you want to go back and study some more, the concept tests are a good place to go because they have those extra explanations if you're if you're confused about it. A lot of these questions come from those concept tests or some variation of them. Okay. Um, these are all conservation of momentum problems. Here's a torque problem, uh, number 21 and 22, 23 and 24. So you can bet you're going to see at least one torque problem, maybe two or three. Okay, see that's exam 4A. Questions about those? All right, let's go to 4B. So 4B was what we just had. So that was the, I did the best on that test of any other. So uh, I think that y'all pretty good on it, but there were some tricky questions, not tricky. I never try to trick you, but like number four, people missed a lot. Uh, if they have two identical blocks of ice, that means they have the same mass, which means that they're going to displace the same amount of water. Because in these, anytime you have a floating object, the buoyant force is equal to the weight. And if that's the case, if the buoyant force is equal to the weight, remember the buoyant force is proportional to the amount of fluid displaced, so they're going to displace the same amount of fluid. So that means that this volume is the same as that volume. Um, likewise, this problem, some of y'all missed, a number of y'all missed, uh, the bigger buoyant force is going to be the same for both of these because they both float, they both have a density less than that of liquid water, um, and they both have the same mass. So the buoyant force will equal to the, the weight. Now, They'll have different amounts above the level of water, but they'll have the same amount of volume below the level of the water. And number three, a lot of y'all missed. So um, this has to do with apparent mass. Uh, I did warn y'all about this. You, we haven't seen many questions about this on the test, but I did warn you about it in the help session. Um, so if this mass is nine kilograms, but it only reads five kilograms, that means that there is a buoyant force acting on this of 40 newtons. I got that by saying 9 minus 5 is equal to 4. That's in kilograms. That's sort of like the mass that it loses on the scale. It loses 4 kilograms. That means there's a force of 4 times 10 or 40 newtons. So there's this 40 newton buoyant force. The 40 newtons is going to equal to the density of the liquid, or water in this case, times the volume times g. And I'm trying to look for a v. So that's... 40 over 1,000 times 10 are 0 0.004. Yeah, 0 0.004. Okay. Pretty sure that made the final. Just want to warn you. These are all about Archimedes, or not Archimedes, uh, Bernoulli's and the equation of continuity. Make sure you know how fluids flow through pipes and what is the relationship between the velocity and the pressure. There's an inverse relationship according to Bernoulli's. If the velocity goes up, the pressure goes down. Uh, be careful, like on number 10, sometimes you have extra stuff that you don't need. Like here, you didn't need to know the density of aluminum. It was just sort of extraneous information. And so, um, in fact, you didn't really need to know any of this, right? Well, no, you did need to know the density of aluminum. You didn't need to know the density of the oil. Uh, it didn't really matter. You might have thought this was an Archimedes problem, but it's not. It's just density is mass over volume. And the, the oil that it displaces is just the volume of the aluminum. So volume is mass over density, or 775 over 2.7. Uh, by the way, these aren't SI units, right? Or these aren't the MKS system. But I can look at the units and do my dimensional analysis by saying 775 grams divided by 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter 
those cancel out, leaving me with centimeters, cubic centimeters, and that's what the answers are all in. So I don't need to do any conversion. I try not to have too many conversions in the questions. They just sort of take up time. Um, manometers, pressure, for stress and strain, Pascal's principle, all these are, are good for the test. Uh, like number 20 where it says Pascal's principle states, just like with the standards of measurement, make sure you can answer this for all of them. I mean, I think they're all here actually, right? This is Bernoulli's, this is Pascal's, this is Archimedes, this is Newton's second law. I think we're just missing an equation of continuity in that list, so. Okay, I think that's it. Other questions about this? Exam 4B or really any other exam? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh yeah, so this is another one. I warned y'all about it. Did y'all hear my warning in the help session? Those help sessions are really useful to listen to. So if you haven't been doing the help sessions, you need to do them going forward for next semester. Um, so F over A, I know, is Y delta L over L. But it says, it doesn't give me delta L or L. But I know that uh, delta L is 1 one hundred or 1%, 1 that's 0 0.01 times L. So I can put that in and say this is 0 0.01 L over L. And then the L's cancel. I don't need to know the L. And then I can go back and solve for F. Because I have um, F is going to be 0 0.01 Y times A. And I know Y, uh, it's on the equation sheet. I forget what it is. It's a big number. And I know A. Uh, a was another tricky part. It had not a trick, but you had to know how to find it. Uh, the radius was 0.1 centimeters, which is 0 0.001 meters. And then once you do that, the area is pi r squared. I do expect you to know the area of a circle, but any other, the area of a circle and the area of a rectangle, but any other area or volume I'll give to you, okay? All right. Sorry. <laughs> what else? All right. Are we good for today? I'll be around. If you have questions, I can answer them. Uh, I'm going to stop this.